Today's video, we're going to be talking about low ticket funnels. Uh, so if you sell mini courses, you sell eBooks, you sell any product on the front end, that's realistically like $150 or less, and you use it to try to grow your business to acquire customers that maybe you want to ascend into other products, you have upsells behind it. And the age old question is, how do I get the cheapest cost per acquisition of a new customer while also maximizing and get the highest amount of AOV so that you can be profitable as you scale ads. I've used low ticket funnels in my agency, in other businesses, in our clients' businesses to really scale up their revenues by attracting higher quality customers, leads essentially. And the whole concept of low ticket, and I'll break it down more in this training, but the whole concept of low ticket is like, if I can go acquire customers and, and I can maximize my AOV on the front end, meaning day zero, I try to get as much money as possible and I try to get the cheapest CPA as possible, there is actually a chance that you can actually be profitable on the front end. And realistically, infopreneurs, course creators uh, have been using these types of funnels to try to scale advertising almost infinitely, right? The concept is if I can spend money to acquire a lead that is higher quality, that has given me their credit card, and I can break even or even profit a little bit uh, on the front end on day zero, then essentially I can acquire leads unlimitedly because ultimately what I'm trying to do with those customers it's not necessarily profit, but ultimately to ascend into higher ticket programs or products down the road, right? So it's a very, very important training, uh, and I don't see too many trainings out there. And so uh, this training was given in a private mastermind mastermind where these members were paying upwards of $25,000 a year to attend. And uh, I was invited to speak. So with that said, of course, I'm going to bring this information to you for free. Enjoy it. Take notes. Uh, and more importantly, understand the principles and the constructs I'm talking about within this training and not just always looking for tactical and, you know, step-by-step -step advice. Look for directional feedback, apply that directional feedback and principles to your business and scale and succeed. So enjoy. Also apologize. Uh, this is back uh, during, I believe, October. So I still had Heman Media Branding, but we are bad marketing now. Uh, but with that said, this training is absolutely valuable. I'm excited for you to enjoy it. Let's dive right into the video. All righty. So today we're going to be talking about low to get ad secrets. I have a lot of content to share and actually a pretty good amount of time to share it. I believe they didn't give me really a time constraint. So we're going to go ahead and roll into it. Where we're going to be talking about today, first, let's start at the basics and the principles. What is a low ticket funnel uh, and why use them? I'm going to talk about the psychology and structure of low ticket funnels themselves. Then we're going to talk about low ticket advertising. And then I'm going to show you some top of funnel frameworks you can use, some remarketing ad frameworks you can use. Cool. All right. Let's dive in now. Start talking about low ticket. Um, what we have to understand first is that low ticket in and of itself has been around for a long time. OK, uh, this is not a new concept. Yes, it's something that we talk about in Internet marketing, but the idea of low ticket or tripwire funnels or value ladders has been around for a very, very long time. Right. And it's not just the Internet space. If you're ever on Amazon. Right. And you see that idea of like frequently bought together. That's an idea of an ascension, a funnel that they're trying to increase the value of your order. Right. Most of you probably didn't know. But when Amazon launched this, their revenues increased 30 percent by adding this feature into their e-commerce stores, right? And the whole idea of what these loss leaders or value ladders or trip wires is, is increase the value that you have. And what the concept is, all we're talking about really when we distill it down is the idea of taking and giving someone what they want, giving them the ability to enhance their satisfaction by increasing what they pay, and then also solving their future needs, right? You can see the same thing in commerce stores, even with vehicles, right? When you go to get a vehicle, what do you do? Well, you get what you want, you get the vehicle, right? But then you can enhance the satisfaction by changing the color paint into maybe a custom color that charges a little bit more money. But then what else do you see? You can even see it right here, right? They add accessories, right? Because it's a future need that you're going to have if you get this vehicle. Right. So you can see the idea and the concept of low ticket funnels or ascensions or value ladders all around us in the world of commerce. Uh, and so it's important for you to recognize that because I'm going to walk you through some of the psychology that you can use inside of these funnels, because that is what's going to allow you to actually scale low ticket funnels that liquidate. OK, we're not just talking about selling products, but how do we actually increase the value of the purchase enough to actually liquidate the cost of advertising that we're trying to get on the front end? OK. So just a few examples, even one of our own, Travis, incredible funnel that he's building right now. 
His is far more than profitable, actually. He was kind enough to share his numbers inside of his low ticket funnel. His offer flow goes from $97 to an upsell of $49 subscription. Then he has a downsell to $299 course, right? His AOV is around $120. But if you look at these metrics right here inside of this sheet, very, very profitable, right? Even in his broad targeting, he's spent $43,000. He's made 72, right? And so you can see even inside of this funnel in and of itself, very profitable. The reason I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you two other different types of low ticket funnels. The reason I'm showing you is that because the template or the actual framework you're using for the low ticket funnel values less than what you're actually offering. The offer is the most important part. And you can use different templates. You can use the different uh, frameworks that people provide. You know, this is just one of his where it's very simple. It's a video path. They go to the landing page. There's a video. There's a CTA button. And then it goes to a checkout. Or you can use the other frameworks I'm showing you. But the modality that you're using to position your low ticket funnel values less than what you're actually doing inside of it. Holistically, principally what you're offering them as a product in an offer, right? And so it's important to recognize that. Here's another one. This is actually using a Dan Kennedy template. Uh, we did this at Traffic and Funnels when we launched. This is a launch offer. So uh, actually kind of more of a closeout sale that we did when I took over the company last year. We did a closeout sale. We spent $13,000. We made $81,000. This template was a Dan Kennedy template that you can look up online. You can see the framework and how it's laid out and then write your own copy into it. But again, the framework doesn't matter as much as what you're actually offering, right? One more option. Oop. Well, maybe. There we go. One more option. This option was from the automatic clients template, uh, Alan Sultanic. We use his funnel. Uh, this was uh, $36,000 made, $32,000 spent. Self-liquidating on the front end, day zero. And then we had about a 8% conversion rate to back-end clients from this. But on day zero, we're profitable on it. It was $49 to $97 to downsell $66 course, right? The frameworks, the template that we're using doesn't matter nearly as much, but the messaging that we're doing inside of it, that's what actually matters. And so that's where I'm going to spend a lot of my time focusing on today. So that if you can apply what you're saying correctly and offering it correctly, that's how you're going to start generating self-liquidating funnels. Okay. So first, why is low ticket actually matter? Why do I think realistically, if you're in the info space or the coaching space, why should people be focusing on it right now? Well, the first thing is, is economic changes, okay? Anytime there is a economic instability inside of the markets that we see, people start to behave differently on how they purchase items, how they purchase products. And by and large, anytime I've seen uh, or talked to people who have gone through really big economic shifts, what you start to see is a widening of the gap in the middle. What you start to see is the people who have the very high priced items, the programs, the masterminds, and then the people who have very low priced items, the masterminds, the programs, those ones start to win. It's the in-between that really start to suffer anytime there's a big economic change, right? And so why I like low ticket, why I propose to you consider low ticket if you aren't already, is because what low ticket allows you to do is to start building trust earlier, right? And for a less price, you're lowering the friction, allowing prospective customers to taste what you have to offer right? So economic changes will change how people impact uh, their purchase decisions, what programs they buy. The next reason I like low ticket is diversified lead flow. Uh, if you are someone who plans to scale your company, um, every single time I've worked with a larger brand and they've been maybe relying on a VSL funnel or a webinar funnel or a lead magnet, as they start to scale, you see diminishing returns from that single funnel, right? You're going to hit a cap at some point to where you just see the costs no longer making sense, or you're being forced to tap into markets that are not nearly as profitable. And what low ticket does is allows you to diversify the markets you can approach or go after. The same person that really wants to buy that low ticket item is not the same person who would sit through your webinar. Or the same person who would go through the webinar or the VSL is not the same person who would purchase a low ticket product from you. So diversified lead flow allows you to start kind of having this puppeteer movement at the top to where you can increase flow or decrease flow on different offers, depending on the performance of them. Some months, you'll start to see that VSLs or webinars is working really well. You can trim down low ticket. Some months, you're going to need to turn up low ticket and trim down the webinar VSL. Or realistically, what happens is with most offers, you're going to have a fatigue point. 
fatigue point means you're running this thing for so long. At some point, your most profitable, most ideal market starts to get tired of it, and you're going to have to recreate it. And if it's the only asset you have, you're either A, going to have to continue pushing spend on a bleeding funnel until you can get it remade, or B, you've got to create something else so that you can keep flow happening. But if you have salespeople, or you manage salespeople, or hey, you just don't want up and down on your revenue, it's great to have diversified lead flow. Next, increase competition and market desire. So essentially what we just want to see uh, or what we've noticed is just that right now, and you guys have probably seen this, everyone has VSL. Everyone has a webinar. Everyone has these modalities of marketing and advertising, but a lot fewer are able to actually pull off a well thought out or actually valuable low ticket offer. Um, a lot of the times what we're seeing is just people throwing up a spreadsheet template or little knickknacks or things that are not inherently valuable. And so when in a world, everyone's running a VSL, low ticket allows you to stand out and to a certain extent, establish a little bit of authority in a market that a VSL or a webinar would not, right? Finally, uh, really kind of the two ones are inside of the same thing, but increased quality of clients and customers. Um, at Traffic and Funnels was really where I started to develop a lot of focus and attention around the idea of low ticket items. It started with a product they had called the Memos, which was a monthly subscription newsletter. But really the concept of what we were seeing was just that the quality of people purchasing those products were exponentially higher quality than the people opting into our webinars, right? In the beginning, what we were noticing is that webinar leads were actually converting into clients faster. So we kept pushing the webinar, kept pushing the VSLs. But then what we started to see was that a lot of the clients coming in had started to actually be past customers or current customers of that low ticket item, but they had purchased it 60 days ago, 90 days ago, 150 days ago, and they had just had a longer time cycle. What we actually realized when we did the math, and this is where we switched aggressively to low ticket items, what we actually realized was that our low ticket customers, their CPA to become a client was around $800 versus our webinar which was around $1,600 to $1,700 to become a client. The difference was, was the time cycle. It took a lot longer for those people to convert into clients, but they were actually much cheaper and much better clients over the longer term, which also speaks back to having diversified lead flow because you get the quicker transaction time with the webinar VSL, longer transaction time with the low ticket, but they were better, higher quality, and cheaper to acquire, right? Cool. Okay. Let's talk about um, basically what I've seen, and this is inside of our company, just to kind of give you an example of why we really like low ticket, why we want to stress other people to start thinking about it, is that inside of our company, we really kind of have like three different prongs that people are becoming clients, right? Our first one is really direct application. Now, this is for an ad agency, so uh, don't think of this as uh, an information product. It's more to the to show you the diversified approach of having multiple levers to bring in clients, right? So these numbers wouldn't really make sense for you. This is for an agency. So first is direct application calls, right? Lead to close time for us, very predictable, anywhere from three to 21 days. Booked call costs, anywhere from 300 to $400. We get about a 50% show rate, 20% close rate, CPA of around $4,000, right? Pretty expensive, but again, remember we're an agency, we have recurring revenue, it's four month contracts, five month contracts, and the AOVs are much higher. So that's actually fairly decent for us. But with that said, that's a predictable time frame of what we look at. Low ticket, however, though, is the most profitable funnel that we have. However, lead to close date, 30 to 90 days, 45 days on average for someone to become a client with buying our low ticket product, right? So example, December through March, spent about 110,000 on mostly meta revenue on the front end, 114,000 from the low ticket funnels. But we had 32 back end sales that came from those, uh, which means about $162,000 in revenue, which means about a 250% return on ad spend. That's our most profitable, but it takes longer. So we have to run the direct booking application ads, right? Now, the most undervalued uh, channel that we have right now is organic. It's free, right? Lead to close is actually unknown. And this is what we've got to get better at. However, uh, even just looking at last 90 days, right? Actually, we have Adam... Uh, um, Adam's here on this call, which is the king of organic. So he would know a lot more than I do, but even just me, I very seldomly do like, I'm not great at content, but I do it semi regularly, but even just looking at last 90 days, 3.1 million non-follower reaches, right? It would cost me $31,000 in ads to reach the same amount of people 
on just doing free content, right? So this is why I think organic is the most underrated uh, channel for people to acquire clients or get attention. Uh, but those are the three prongs that we look at, right? So as you can see here, it's the pronged approach. It's the three pronged approach, having multiple channels. That's what actually is providing value for us. But low ticket still by and large is the most profitable channel for us. Cool. Overall concept, run through this. Overall concept of a low ticket funnel is very simple, right? You have a sales page, you go to order form, you go to upsell, you have a downsell, you have upsell two, you have order confirmations, right? The whole concept of what we're trying to talk about here is the very simple of, can I spend $10,000 on ads? Could I acquire a hundred customers with those ads? And could I get a CPA of around hundred dollars? That means my AOV is around hundred dollars, right? If I spend $10,000, but I make $10,000 back on day zero. That means I'm net spending $0. That's the goal of what we're trying to talk about. Okay. So everyone ready for psychology and structures of low ticket funnels. Give me a psych in the comments. I know that was a lot. I want to make sure you're still with me. Psych, psych. Great. Cool. So talking about the psychology of low ticket funnels, Really, over the last eight years, um, I've personally built dozens and dozens of low-ticket funnels uh, and reviewed hundreds, if not thousands, of frameworks, templates, strategies, other funnels at this point. Uh, I've just reviewed a ton. Uh, it's my business. It's my job. Uh, but it's also what I love. And at the end of the day, uh, what I've really realized is that the low-ticket funnel to reach its maximum potential uh, is that you have to see the funnel as a holistic solution to the marketplace. Okay. Don't see it as just a, here's my front end offer, here's my upsell, here's my upsell too, but see the whole funnel itself as a holistic solution of what you're trying to provide to the market, okay? Um, because I think a lot of the times what I see when I look at funnels uh, for people who are just getting into low ticket is that there's really no great synergy inside of the funnel that would cause people to have a great upsell take rate or upsell to take rate. There's really no synergy. And so even if you start to feel like you got that first product, it seems to be doing well, your CPAs are great. You're like, man, but we just can't get our ad cost down. Most of the time, most of the time, it is not a question of can you get your ad cost down? It is can you get your AOV up? It is exponentially easier for you to increase the AOV on your funnel than it is going to be to bring your ad cost down unless you're just doing something really atrocious inside of your ad accounts, right? Which could happen, but more times than not, it is your AOV is not high enough, not your CPA is not low enough, right? So what I actually tell people to do is to start with what is your expected CPA, general range. If you don't know where to put it at, ask friends, see if you know competitors and what their numbers are. But what I actually recommend you to do is go, what is my assumed CPA? What is the general range that I think I could land at? And then build your funnel, making sure that you have an AOV that's higher than that. Because that's going to help you save so much time. I see a lot of people really burning a lot of cash because they spend all their time trying to bring the ad cost down, bring CPAs down rather than AOVs up. Okay. So let's talk about persuasion because at the end of the day, that's all this is, 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 is a form of persuasion, low ticket funnels, advertisements, all of it. And I'm going to show you what a flow for your sales page or your funnel can be as well as your ads, but it all starts with understanding what persuasion is at the end of the day. I like to give the example of a three-legged stool. Uh, you guys know the metaphor, right? What happens if I take away one of the legs in a three-legged stool? It falls over, right? So your ads, your funnel, your sales pages, all of them, you need to be acquiring or including these elements and ensure that you're doing them correctly. So the first leg is desire, right? So your offer, your advertisements, your sales pages, all must offer and entice uh, your market to capitalize on what they actually yearn for now. This does not mean what you think they need. It's important that if you're leveraging on the desire, you understand what they actually want. And your advertisements, as Eugene Schwartz says, my favorite advertiser of all time, he says the prospect must be able to visualize every drop of satisfaction that their achievement will give, right? The goal here inside of desire is to understand what they think the desire actually is and to be able to build an offer or an angle that enforces their worldview on what they think they need. If you are a business coach, right? We all know that mindset is pretty much everything, right? But if you ever try to launch a mindset course, probably didn't do well. Not unless you have a big name brand. Just doesn't. Because at the end of the day, no one really wants to believe that mindset is their problem. Even if it actually is what their problem is. What we all want is a spreadsheet calculator that'll solve all my problems. We want a Facebook ad template that'll fix my funnel. 
So you have to understand what does my market actually think is wrong? What do they actually think their solution should be or could be? And you realistically need to align what you're trying to offer them in the worldview that they have. If you try to disrupt your market's worldview, it will probably never work. So you have to have the ability to where they feel understood, they feel that you're in alignment with them, and you have to earn the right to actually educate them to what their actual solutions should be, could be, or would be, right? So that's the first leg. Second leg is identity. Identity, right? This is important because no one really buys products before what they, for what they do. No one buys a Ferrari because it goes from point A to point B. We buy Ferraris because of what it says about us or what it enforces inside of us that we believe or want to believe, right? So identification is not just the idea of, hey, can you show them what they desire, what they actually believe that they desire, but can you also enforce the identity they want to assume by getting that solution, by getting that desire, right? People want to be able to fix their marketing because we also want to be known as a competent business owner, a progressive or innovative business owner. So there's an identity that someone is attaching to your product, your service that you should be enforcing inside of them when they actually make a conversion decision, right? Eugene Schwartz calls this identification, right? So that's the concept. We don't just buy things for the solution they give us. We buy them because of what it says about us when we convert. And as humans, we don't just buy things for utility, uh, but we want to be able to see, be seen as higher esteem. We buy them either consciously or subconsciously because we're searching for meaning, we're searching for the symbols, we're searching for the embodiments that that purchase decision actually provides to us or bestows upon us, right? This is why people shop at Whole Foods versus Walmart. You can buy an apple at either one, but shopping at one says something about us. So even at Whole Foods, I'll be willing to pay more because of what it says about me when I make that purchase. Same thing of Gucci versus Nike. We can say that Gucci has a way better quality of product, but let's face it, it doesn't. And it's a t-shirt. Is it really worth 10x the value? No, but we'll make that purchase decision because of what it says about us, right? Or what we're trying to say about ourselves, okay? So when you can understand about where are they coming from, and I'll show you where all of those areas could be here in a second, but when you can understand that not just the utility of what they want, what is the desire they have, but what are they wanting that desire to say about them? that's when you can start crafting a much more potent angle offer, okay? Finally, belief, belief. So prospects really wanna make a conversion decision uh, to be affirmed in two areas. One, they wanna make sure that they're having their core assumptions and beliefs reinforced, okay? No one wants to buy a product and then realize that that wasn't the problem they had all along. Some of you are trying to get really clever in your marketing and advertising and you're throwing people off and you're throwing off their core assumptions and they're no longer purchasing because you're throwing off their core assumptions. We want our beliefs reinforced, not dictated or crushed on, right? We want to believe that that problem we thought was wrong all along was actually the problem and you found a better way to solve it. The second thing is they want their purchase decision not to blow up their face, right? The laziest form of this instilling belief that we say in the market, if you do this, don't worry, it's fine. But the laziest form of building belief is guarantees. The laziest form of building marketing belief is guarantees. This happens or you don't pay. This happens or your money back. That is not actually building belief. That's building hedged risk, which is not the same thing. It's a form of it, but it's not the same thing. If you want great marketing, you want them to be so confident in what they're doing, they're already imagining the future state that they have right? So if, if you've got to remember the kind of, there's a core concept inside of low ticket funnels, right? It's sell them what they want, sell them more of what they want and sell them against the problem they're going to have in the future. Because the reason for that is because if you can get them considering the problems they're having in the future, and now they're considering buying your product to fix a problem they don't have yet, what are they now already assuming? That their problem has been solved, which builds belief, which then makes them feel more confident about their purchase decision right? So we want to make sure that as we're making purchase decisions, it's not going to blow up in our face. And so as you're building advertisements, sales pages, don't just talk about the desire. Don't just talk about what it says about them, but enhance the belief that it's actually going to be solved. What does their morning look like the next day once this problem has been solved? 
right? What does their business look like next year? How does it feel? What kind of freedom do, will they feel when no longer do they have to worry about X, Y, Z? If you can start to build that future state in their mind with your ad sales pages, whatever, that starts to build belief, which is the final leg of persuasion. Make sense? This is good? Too slow? Too fast? Oof, rough. Okay, moving on. Let's talk about the nine psychological motivators. <clears throat> so this is what I was talking about earlier, right? What are those things that uh, people want to identify as or they charge after when making a purchase decision? This is a, a mistake I think a lot of marketers uh, make, namely because we have all probably heard about the concept of going, what is their hell? What is their heaven, right? And then your product or service is the way to get them from hell to heaven, which is amazing but there's a large gap in between it that a product or service cannot actually do, which is motivation. How do you actually get them the motivation to take action? I love the, the example of if you've ever been laying on a couch, right? And you've been hungry, really hungry, but the fridge feels so far away. So you end up just laying there on the couch, not doing anything, right? You had a pain, you had a desire, but the motivation was not high enough to actually get off the couch, right? So understanding what your market is motivated by is actually the thing to get them from hell to heaven. The product or service is just wrapped in the motivation, okay? Product or service is not in and of itself what they want. It's the motivation that the product or service can actually provide them. That's what they actually want, right? So people will operate in different motivators. There's nine psychological motivators. There's achievement, autonomy, belonging, competence, empowerment, engagement, esteem, nurturance, security. These are the different motivators that people will use to make decisions. Different marker, uh, different markets will lean more on different motivations than others, right? Example, if you're an entrepreneur, guessing security is not that big of a motivation for you, unless it's financial freedom, which is actually freedom and autonomy, not security. You're not an entrepreneur if security is the highest leverage or motivator that you have, right? So if I'm marketing to, to entrepreneurs, I'm probably going to be talking about Competence, esteem, autonomy. Those are probably the motivators I'm going to focus on because those are the things that are actually moving you to make decisions, right? So now, as you're building your products, if you have a low ticket product right now, you got to start thinking about this is, okay, how can I get my product or service to increase the autonomy they have in life? If I just say, I'm going to fix your Facebook ads, that's lame. But if I can talk about how Fixing your Facebook ads actually allows you to autonomously grow your business or not have to hover in your ads manager or hover over your media buyer and it builds your autonomy back. I'm increasing the reason for them to actually take action, make a decision. That's a much more powerful marketing angle, right? So focus on motivators, establish what they are. And then really, as you start to build your advertising, your marketing, come back to it of going, how are we enhancing the psychological motivators that we know our market has? Cool. These are the ones uh, that will actually help align to either desire, identity, or belief. They're color coded. Um, I'm gonna. I'll make sure that uh, Anik gets these slides so you guys can use them in the future. But if you guys are going, okay, how do we? We have desire, we have identity, but how do we actually start building a little bit of belief? They're all here, color coded, coded, and you can make sure your marketing aligns around them. Cool. Now, both your ads and your sales funnels should look like this flow. So um, really, if we're taking inside of the three-legged stool approach here, um, the really sales page flow, that's very simple. You know, there's a lot of different templates out there. Uh, there's a lot of different things you can purchase. But holistically, what I want you to make sure that you're following when you're looking at your sales page flow is does it flow through these concepts? In the beginning, are you enticing and calling out the desire that your market actually has? Not the market you think they should have, but the market, the, the desire they actually have. You have a want-driven headline. Uh, is your, do you address the sickness that the market has, whether it's them personally, or is it a sickness someone else is causing them? Are you immediately going to that? Uh, do you hint and present the solutions? Then you move into demonstrate the prospect's ability to identify. So all of a sudden, now that this desire is happening, what does it say about them? Now, key here is sometimes it's tricky to say what is happening to them, meaning once they've fulfilled on this desire, what does that therefore transform them into? If you can't do that, make it about you, make it about a person. You want to add a character to it 
to where that desire and the hero's journey has now transformed this person into what they can do now, right? This is why case studies, testimonials, DGCs are so valuable is because it personifies the identification shift that someone can go through, right? Then you go into belief and you guys have, can see that. So inside of the funnel, just like how the sales page follows a certain flow where you go from desire to identification to belief, your funnel as a whole can actually structure and flow this way as well. Whereas the sales page does this vertically, your funnel does this horizontally, meaning after your core product, you can actually move into your tripwire, which is desire-based, then upsells, which is typically identification-based, right? This is an enhancement of that initial desire that they had, right? So examples like the reason someone would get the upgrades on a car is not because their desire really changed but because their identity is actually someone that wants the upgrades. We don't just want the baseline model, right? So even inside of your upsell, it's how can we enhance the experience? How can we make it sure? Or how can we make it faster for them, right? And so in your upsells, you're looking for that product or that thing that would enhance the experience or the solution that they get from the core product, okay? This could be you're selling a product or a training, but then coaching is an upsell because now it's an enhanced experience to make it sure and quicker for them to actually get the desired result they had in the first product, right? Then in your next upsell, belief. This is that whole concept we talked about earlier where the easiest thing to do here is what's the next problem that they would have, right? If I'm selling you on a Facebook ad course, well, then I might go, okay, here is our Facebook ad course test to scale method, right? This is one of the products I was showing you earlier. The upsell was a scaling masterclass, right? Because, hey, now all of a sudden you're testing to scale, but now you need to scaling masterclass because you're more than just a beginner. You have more than just a baseline budget running. So now you need to learn how to scale, right? And then inside of that funnel, well, what might come next is, okay, well, now that you have all these leads, you're scaling, you don't know how to nurture them and you're costing yourself so much money. It's going to, money is just going to drop through that bucket. So now I'm going to position a lead nurturing system for you, right? I'm solving the future problem that you're going to have if you get my product one and product two, and now you're going to need product three, so you might as well get that. And I'm building the belief inside of it, right? And so you want to look at your funnel as a whole going, it's a holistic solution that I'm providing, not product one, upsell one, upsell two. It's all of them flow together. And that's how you start to increase the conversion rates. All right. Advertising 101. Advertising 101. Now, this is kind of the that uh, that sales page flow that we just talked to ads, specifically ads, what we like to focus on mainly is that top of funnel, we're appealing the desire, okay? Um, the point of the ads is not really to get the sale. The point of the ad is to attract enough attention to get them to click and go to the landing page, okay? So that's really what we're trying to do. So most top of funnel ads, specifically in the low ticket markets, we're looking at the desire and how can we expand, extract, or pivot that desire in different ways or different angles. And so that's really where we're focusing on, right? We wanna attract what is it that we believe that they think is the, the solution? What is the sickness that they are doing? And how can we then diagnose that sickness in the ads at top of funnel to provide the desire that they're actually looking for? In remarketing, we're looking a lot more into the identification because we're established already the desire that they're looking for. And now we want to start articulating the identity or the identification that they would have for getting this product. This is why UGCs or testimonials in remarketing do so well, because while it also builds proof, what it also is actually doing is helping identification of past customers that took the product, it worked for them, and it's almost borrowing the identity from those customers and placing it into your prospect's hands. Okay. And this is also why if you're running testimonials, it's best to not just run one type of testimonial. If they're all the same demographic, you want different demographics. You want a, a female, you want a male, a mom, a dad, you want a single, like you want different types of people because your prospects will identify with the people that they're seeing inside of those testimonials. So you want diversity because it's a part of identification. And if you can borrow the identification that someone else has already gone through, that will help your remarketing efforts improve. Next one is building belief, right? So this is a part of the objection handling. I'm going to show you the framework for remarketing uh, to build belief. Um, and so I won't spend too much time there. All right. Top of funnel. I'm moving through this quick. Going too fast or good speed? Cool. Cool, cool, cool. All right. So top of funnel. 
If you guys have never uh, studied Eugene Schwartz or know about uh, the states of awareness, don't worry about it. You can look it up online really easy, but he came up this with this very simple concept that every market uh, each person in a market normally is in uh, one of five states of awareness, right? One is completely unaware. You don't see that on this screen because I wouldn't actually really encourage that for low ticket products. It's probably not, if that's your market, low ticket products is probably not actually for you. That would be an info product, lead magnet, VSL, webinar, things like that. But for low ticket, normally your market, uh, the five states, so it's unaware, problem aware, meaning they're aware of a problem, but they're not aware of anything else, right? Think if you think back to washing machines, right? Uh, people were aware that doing laundry took way too long, but no one knew that there was automatic dishwashers or washing machines, right? So problem aware, then there's solution aware. You might know that there's a solution out there, but you don't know of the brands. You just know that there's something that can wash clothes faster. There's product aware. All of a sudden now I know about Samsung or LG. And then fully aware is like, okay, I know all the deals probably. I'm probably window shopping, I'm testing stuff, right? So these are the main areas that you're going to see a market within uh, your advertising or purchasing your low ticket products, right? So really, I'm going to show you an example of like an ad uh, for each one. What types of ads should you be running if you realize your market is in one category versus another, right? So the first one uh, is problem aware right? They, they're aware of a problem, but they're probably not really aware of a solution. Here's an example. And when you have that market, what you want to do is start in your ads with the problem and then refine it into a need or solution. Okay. So in this ad, you can see, for example, this was selling uh, our, actually the test to scale method. This ad, you can see it starts off with addressing a problem, right? Ever felt like you're playing battleships with Facebook ads, right? I'm not addressing that there's a possible solution. I'm trying to connect with the problem that they're currently experiencing. Can they relate to it, right? So just as an example, uh, let me see if I can actually pull this up for you. And let me actually see if I can share audio real quick. Boom, boom, cool. Let me see if this plays. All right, Mark, what's your next move? account bud huh sorry are you trying to scale right now oh st you sunk my battle ads <laughs> another one bites the dust H have you got ad account support i should have lol have you got good copy yep you sunk it oh i'm on a roll now have you got targeted audiences set yep have you got the test to scale method by human media i mean i should have because i'm the ceo but your mark Zuckerberg, right? Real talk. If you've ever tried to... Cool. So that ad you can see is entirely based around the pain. Problem, right? And you can start to see how we're merging that problem into... Have you heard about the test of scale method by Human Media? We're taking the problem that's the entire focus. Can we paint a better picture of it, right? Can we make it goofy? But then can we transition that problem into the solution that they're looking for, right? So then when they're only really known about the problem, they don't know that there's this test to scale method. They don't know about all these courses because we created the product as a test to scale, which was built for beginners realistically. When we understood that, we had to realize that like, if we just came out of scale your ads to 5X row ads, that actually doesn't work because they're not actually really aware of all that stuff. They're just having problems, right? So the next one, Come back here. Oh, oh. The next one uh, is essentially solution aware. And when you have a market that's solution aware, what you're really trying to do is just position uh, your brand and product up front, right? When they already kind of understand that there are solutions out there, what you're trying to do is really just position what you do, what you, who you are up front, because they're already looking for a solution out there. They understand that they exist. So now it's a matter of how can I stand out and offer them what they're actually looking for? And so inside of this one, I'll just keep this tab open here. Let me just kind of... The solution that they're looking for is what exactly we put inside of the headline, right? The ultimate playbook to ensure all your real estate deals are oversubscribed. What they're looking for is investors. What they're looking for is a plethora of people that want to join them on these deals. And so in the ad, what we're doing is presenting that right up the front, right? I don't need to talk about the problem. 
I can talk about it inside of the ad copy, but what I'm trying to do to get their attention on the front end is presenting the solution that they're already looking for, right? And I'm giving them the product initially so that they already feel attached to the thing that they've been searching for already, right? It's very simple. It's nuanced, but it's very important that you, A, you know what your market is. Are they problem aware, solution aware, product aware, or fully aware? But then once you do, all your ads should just focus on that right up front to the start. I think what I see a lot of the times is when people are running low ticket is they try to really do a wide net when you don't actually have to. It's very, the human psychology, what I always tell people is like, humans are very unique by and large, but the way we make decisions and our behaviors are not, they're very, very synchronous. They're, it's calculated. We've been tracking it for hundreds of years. Humans and the way we make decisions are not unique. And so if you can understand where they are in their cycle or their state of awareness, Everything in your ad can just go right at that one thing, and you don't need to spend time testing everything else, which is where a lot of bleed inside of low ticket funnels come from. Next one, uh, if they're product aware, what you want to do is either position your brand and product up front or throw rocks at competing solutions. This is an example, very, very simple, but you can tell right off the bat what this would be going after. The product is right here inside of the creative. Get the consulting cash flow calculator. Right up here at the top, you can't improve what you don't measure. When someone is product aware, they're knowing what they're looking for. It's very, very easy to put it right up front. And it's very direct. Ads here do not have to be long. The copy doesn't have to be long. You can see here it's very, very short, uh, but it's a very, very powerful one. And so if you know your product is looking or if your customers are looking for a specific product, just demonstrate the product up front. You don't need to spend a lot of time on pain. They're already aware of it. You don't need to spend a lot of time talking about the value of the solution. They're already aware of it. You can just present the product up front. And your goal is how do I make this product seem unique? How do I make this compare different to others, right? And you can do that by either you know presenting your USP, what makes you unique up front, or throwing rocks at the alternative solutions that people would go to, okay? Very simple. Finally, fully aware right? Fully aware. Um, if they're fully aware, this normally means that they are very much, they've analyzed probably competing offers. They probably window shop. They, if you're a coach, they might've hopped on with other coaching programs uh, or other info products and seen what they're like. And so they're comparing. So here it's either three options, either A, position your brand and product up front or B, position your USP or three, throw rocks at competing solutions. Uh, this ad here, uh, this ad actually made me a lot of money. This ad probably made me at least a half a million dollars by itself. Do you guys want to see that ad? Yeah, yeah. I actually don't know where the chat went. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm seeing you guys. Sorry. All right. Yo, you guys are about to see a glow up too. Oof. Rough. Hi guys. I actually I'm needed to work to get out. Started. Big day, homie. Huge day, homie. Copy that DM. Only easy day was yesterday. Any day above ground. 1% better every day. You're only one day away from greatness. Right. So let's get started. Journey of a thousand miles starts with one step. The only failure is the failure to try. Better today than you were yesterday. It's a new season for your business. I was hoping to get some advice on Awesome, homie. We'll show you how we made $6 million in 45 seconds with paid track. Oh! You can make money while you sleep, dog. We'll show you the secret formula to scaling those ads. Tell told you what every media buyer wishes they knew when they first started. Drop those CPMs, homie. CTRs are on the rise, dog. Gotta scale those ads up. iOS 14. Ah, losing track at home. iOS 14. iOS 14. Oh, crap. iOS 14. iOS 14. IOS 14. Oh! It's been a rough couple of months. You're more than your results, homie. Hashtag fail forward, bro. Right. If we could skip to the part where you help me with my ads. I have to detect an attitude. Do we have a mentality problem here? No, I don't have a mentality. Hashtag grumpy to great. Failure to plan is planning to fail. Your mess is your message, homie. Gotta have that mamba mentality. Rise and grind, dog. Enough. Are you going to help me with my ads or not? Of course, homie. All you had to do was ask. Don't be an asshole. Waste not, want not. All you need to do is... Looks like we're all out of time today. Hashtag gratitude.
Another happy client, brother. Hashtag massive value, bro. One percenter mindset. <laughs> All right. So as you can see here, though, the whole concept is throwing rocks, right? We're making fun of the other people. And literally the headline of the ad is why some marketers deserve to be slapped, right? And so in a world where we already know that our market is fully aware, they know there's other products, they know the solutions, they know the problems, then I don't need to focus on any of that because they already understand it. So now it's either A, how can I stand out? But B, can I just throw rocks at the competing solutions? And we just happen to do it in this way of entertainment and being different, right? And so that's the whole concept of if they're fully aware, it's either position your product, uh, product or brand up front, but realistically the better ones is position your USP or throw rocks at competing offers, right? Cool. So next, remarketing. Remarketing, you can just scan this uh, this part if you'd like. Uh, that QR code will give you a Google Drive uh, link to this image. But remarketing uh, is all about objection handling. Anytime someone doesn't purchase a product, doesn't convert on a product, doesn't take action, most likely, unless they were just busy, uh, was that there was an objection that came up internally, consciously, or even subconsciously sometimes that you did not handle inside of your advertisements. And so when we look at remarketing, what we're really trying to do is to overcome those objections uh, through our advertisements that we send back to the user, right? And so there's really kind of four main objections for someone not buying. One, the ad was just boring or not special, right? Two, they don't trust you. Three, they don't believe your claims. Or four, they're just not sold, right? So if they were in objection number one, where the ads were just boring or not special, the remarketing of those ads, the goal is, and these ads, how can we say that we're different, right? And the best ways that I've seen overcome those objections is through one of three different ad modalities. One is introing a mechanism, right? Mechanism is essentially the person, technology, or the reason why you can fulfill on your promise in a unique way, right? So introing the mechanism is a way to show you're different. Us first them is basically even literally just comparing what we do versus what competitors do. In that simple of terms in an ad is an easy way to show how are you different, right? Uh, that ad is a perfect example that we just did of slapping the marketer, right? That ad would be an easy example if we inside of the body copy really brought out what does our program actually do? We do four live coaching calls a week. You get to meet with my actual CMO. I'm on every Tuesday, right? Like you get access to the Slack community. If we had started including that, that would be a perfect us versus them style of ad, right? Final one is urgency and FOMO. This does not work as great for info products unless you actually have, and really you should never do this unless you actually have real urgency or real FOMO that you can provide for FTC compliance. This is mostly beneficial in e-commerce companies when they have limited stock, limited supply, or if you are selling a book that has limited supply, urgency and FOMO is a great way to say, you know, why are you different? It really helps stand out because other companies might not be having the same logistics issues or constraints. Objection two, they don't trust you. So now the goal is how can I prove who I am, right? This is where UGCs or testimonials come into play or introducing your USP, your unique selling proposition, right? If you have a USP, it's unique selling proposition. It's unique to you and no one else can actually use it. That is a way of you proving who you actually are because that inserts authority, that inserts credibility that other people cannot just directly rip off. If they have the objection number three, then it's how can I prove what I say? It's different than them not trusting you. It's them not believing your claims, okay? There's a unique, distinct difference between those two, especially in the info space. A lot of the times, it's not what you're saying. It's they don't trust you. And so you need to actually talk about you inside of the ads, not just about what you're trying to say to them or what your claims are, but what is your background? Why should I trust that Adam can be the guy to show me how to grow YouTube than anyone else. Uh, plenty of people are saying YouTube is great. So how do I know Adam is the guy, right? On the flip side, I might know that Adam is the guy. I've seen his channels, but how do I actually know he can train other people how to do it or do it for other people, right? So it's like understanding that there's a distinct difference between those objections. And so the ads you create have to address them differently. And the objection number three, the ads that I see there is UGC testimonial, just like objection number two, but instead of USP, if their objection is in what you're saying, then have demonstration ads, right? Uh, if you have something that you can actually demonstrate in front of an audience or on camera, then that's a great one. If you can't do a demonstration on camera, 
then even a walkthrough of a case study is a great way to do this, but in a formalized case study way, not just a, here's a testimony or you just see, but a case study of this is client A, this is when they came in, this is what we did, this is the shifts they made, this is the transformation. That is a great way of a demonstration if you can't actually show someone on camera, right? Objection number four is not sold, right? So now it's how can I say it in a new way? right? If the first way I said it to them was just didn't sell them, um, then how can I say it in a brand new way? And this is where you introduce the mechanism again, or pure humor. I love humor. Um, consumers more and more today are gravitating towards personal brands. I think very much over the next three, five, 10 years, you're just going to see so much more personal brands skyrocketing, skyrocketing, right? I mean, you saw Prime launched January, 2022, $250 million in revenue. Beast Burgers launched in 2020, over $100 million in revenue. Uh, Skims, Kim Kardashian's valued at $4 billion, right? Like you have all these brands blowing up because they're attached to personal brands and people can relate to it, right? Humor is a great way to do it. It builds brand affinity. So if you can't just convince them, a great way to actually just get their attention is to get them to at least like you or they at least like the con content that you do, right? I have plenty of people in my comment sections. My comment sections are atrocious. If you ever want to laugh, you can go look at them. But there's plenty of people actually comment. It's like, they think I'm a scammer, but they just think my ads are hilarious. And so they'll keep commenting. Eventually, if I could demonstrate enough value in front of them that should show them I know what I'm doing, they'll convert, right? So pure humor is one of my favorites. Then five, uh, the finally stage five, which is a brand new appeal. Um, this mostly has to do with burned out markets, which actually is pretty relevant to low ticket or info space companies. Uh, in basically stage five of aware, uh, of not stage five awareness, stage five of sophistication, according to Eugene Schwartz, is essentially just when the market is burned out. They've heard all the claims, all the promises. And so in stage five, the advertising you have to do is a brand new appeal. Example, Axe Body Spray. It helps you smell good, right? Do any of their ads talk about smelling good or sanitation? Absolutely not. What happens? You spray Axe Body Spray and a horde of women will find you somehow like a zombie apocalypse and they will grab onto you, right? It's not about the product. It's about sex appeal, right? That's a stage five sophistication ad. They've completely abandoned the actual value prompts of the ad. And now they're just looking for a completely different value prompt angle, right? That's an example of it. Um, and so for yours, it's like, okay, if we feel like the market is completely burned out on this, how can I radically change what I'm trying to say? 